Welcome. I'm Dr. Mochaba Mohader, co-organizer of the Mobility Roundtable based at the Scapin's Eye Research Institute at Harvard Medical School in Boston. Uh, my co-organizer, Dr. Andrew Tomlinson from the University of Leeds in the UK, uh, will guide the introduction and we'll, we'll both uh, guide the Q&A and uh, close the session. Andrew, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mojtaba. So uh, today's roundtable uh, topic, as uh, Mojtaba introduced, mobility and safety is uh, saving lives worth the cost or saving more lives worth the cost. So as you know, we have a mobility system that works quite well, and most people arrive in one piece at their destination. Obviously, accidents and incidents will happen, but relatively infrequently, due to the great progress that's been made um, over the last, you know, well, over the last period of time. Uh, and really, the question today is, you know, how far do we, how far should we go in focusing on safety? Is it really worth trying to save more lives? Uh, it's a, a little bit controversial. So we've got a really strong panel today, a very distinguished panel, that are going to uh, di discuss this. So as with all our roundtables, we're going to start off with a, each panelist will introduce themselves and talk on the subject for between five and seven minutes, and then we'll have our um, roundtable discussion and take questions from the audience. So the first panelist today, we're very privileged to have uh, Yves Dacour, who uh, is currently with a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, uh, but previously was uh, formerly the Director General of the Inter International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, and he's specifically interested in looking at, at his uh, profile specifically interested in changes to the way society uh, operates and I think he has uh, some um, particular opinions on this topic so I'll just hand over to Eve to start our discussion thank you thank you very much Andrew very pleased to uh, to join you thank you so much Taba for for the invitation um, uh, true Andrew I'm right now in Boston and I'm, I'm happy to uh, to be in Harvard where I'm trying to uh, set up a, a pop-up institute uh, bring the academic excellence with the notion of art, which is focus few years on one specific subject. And what I'm trying right now is to focus on the questions of security and surveillance and how much our social contract is impacted by COVID-19, but also by the world in which we operate when it comes to surveillance uh, and specifically the role of cities. And I'm here not so much as a fellow of Berkman Klein Center, but maybe more with my previous uh, uh, hat, which was the CEO of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And as you can see, I didn't have anything to do with mobility safety, uh, but I have a lot to do about life saving. And I think I have a very strong opinion <laughs> about the questions you're asking. And I know it's always a very complex framework about the benefit and cost when you talk about life and human life specifically, right? And we can have a long discussions. By the way, there is such a big discussion when it comes to COVID-19 including in this country right now in the US and you know, how far you go, how far you close the economy and, and is it worthwhile in terms of the numbers of people that you, you're saving and is it worthwhile, especially if the people are aged, you know? So it's always very difficult ethical questions. But what I would like to do today just quickly is to try to compare what I've seen in my previous job. Uh, and what my interest was, was very clearly uh, relate, related to armed violence, right? which is always interesting to, to see, you know, harm and the impact it has on people, and then to look maybe more specifically at some of the questions related to mobility. Uh, so when you took at, at, on, on armed violence, just to have a sense, and I'm talking at a, at a broad perspective, so organized armed violence kill every year between 500 to 535,000 people. So half a million people are killed when it comes to armed violence. And if you zoom in, you have hundreds of thousands of people killed directly in wars, right? This is since, let's say, the years 2010, to give you a sense. In the modern history, in terms of numbers of people killed and impact on society, of course, the World War II was the biggest when we had more than uh, 10, yeah, depends on the, on the figures, but let's say 70 to 80 millions who died during the World War II. Uh, but in general, over the last 10 years, we have between five, yeah, 500,000 people who are dying by, by armed violence. I'm just saying that because it doesn't say anything. When you just put the numbers like that, it doesn't tell you anything about a society, except, of course, that you have people killed, you have families which are suffering. And what we were working at the time in the Red Cross was also to look at the impact in the, at the society level, right? And then when you start to look at the impact of conflict, 
and armed violence on society, then the figures are much more different because it touched the social fabric of a society. And then you even try to put some numbers around that. And then you start to look at that. We are talking, for example, in terms of armed violence, of a figures of $400 billion on a yearly base, right? Which means if you even look at the GDP uh, growth of an average economy, it means that it will decrease by more than 2% on a yearly basis. And you can then zoom in, look at the context like Syria, for example, where uh, uh, the conflict has totally destroyed not only the social fabric, but the entire economy of a society. So I think uh, when we say about saving life and, and the cost of saving life, for us, the first thing is very clear is not just to look at the individual, but to look at the direct and the indirect cost and the impact it has on society. And what struck me in my, in my work at the, at the Red Cross was that I was always dealing with violence, um, with armed violence, with, in fact, uh, a lot of uh, direct and indirect consequences of wars in, in a lot of different contexts. And when I was discussing with people, communities, but also officials, there was always a comparison and a reflections about one of the other major issues in a country, including country at war, which was, in fact, road safety and, and the impact. And here I'm, I'm zooming in more specifically when we talk about mobility and safety, we can go large, but here I'm really looking at, at road accidents, right? And if, and again, I'm, I'm careful what I'm saying, but if you just look in terms of numbers and I'm sure Jan and Oliver will, will complete me because they are experts in that one, but okay, just in terms of numbers. So we're talking about what? 1.2, 1.3 million people dying on the, on the yearly base uh, of road accidents. We are, which means what, 3,000 people dying every day, just to, just to remember the impact it has. We are talking of, uh, of uh, 50 to 60 million people being injured. Uh, and of course, we immediately try to see that in a lot of society, including in a, in a developed uh, society, uh, the impact of road accidents remain extraordinarily high. And what is interesting is, if you look at on the Red Cross perspective, we are talking here on a man-made disaster, I would say, right? That has a huge impact. Uh, 1.3 million people dying a year, if I compare with my work uh, on, on war and natural disaster, is three times the impact of the tsunami in, the, in Indonesia, Sri Lanka, uh, and, and Northeast Asia uh, at the time. So just, just to give you a bit of a sense of what are we talking about. And maybe what is even the most interesting element for us, and that is why we were so interested about and still so interested about uh, a road accident and the impact it has on society it is very clearly that there is a di direct link between road safety and road safety improvements and poverty reduction. No questions. You can show it that right now in terms of cost, for example, uh, there is clearly uh, the cost of road accidents are much bigger in a lot of developing country than just the aids they are receiving from developed world. So I think that is one of the critical elements. And for us, that was one of the reasons why we joined at the time uh, in 2010. In fact, um, an initiative, a Global Road Safety Partnership, to try to, at the local Red Cross, try to build that. And what is amazing, Andrew, and we'll talk about that, is today, uh, it's still about awareness. Sometimes it sounds amazing. It's still about a prevention. So basic elements are still there in order to be able to change that. Uh, and, and that's what I would say. So we will have the time to respond. So the, the answer for me is from the Red Cross perspective, from a humanity perspective, the answer is yes, it's worthwhile. And yes, we have to address the questions, including the questions of road accidents. And yes, in 2020, this is still a major issue. And yes, we can compare that with other big issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Eve, for a very strong uh, introduction. That was really, really uh, interesting and very um, informative comparing the number of people dead through armed violence with the number of road uh, accident casualties. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. And we'll come back to you with the questions in a little while. So our second uh, panelist today is uh, Professor Oliver Carsten, who's been a professor of transport safety for almost 20 years. Uh, he's actually a colleague of mine. I can see him smiling uh, at the uh, Institute for Transport Studies here in Leeds. I'd, I will say a very well-respected academic who also works as an advisor 
uh, to governments on safety matters and sits on a number of international standards committees setting the agenda for vehicle manufacturers in their approach uh, to safety. So I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Oliver to, and we'll hear what he uh, says on the subject. Thank you. So thank you very much, Andrew. It's a real pleasure to be here and a really interesting question. I mean, in one way, one could reframe the question as we know the cost uh, we know of the road casualty problem and of trauma on the roads. Uh, we know who's suffering it. So one of the interesting things about who's suffering it, it is the poor. It's the poor around the world, the less developed countries, as Eve has already indicated. And even within the developed countries, it tends to be the poorer, the less well off and that suffer the most. Uh, so we get problems. I mean, we can look, look zoom in uh, to a place like Leeds. And what you'll find in is the uh, lower income inner city areas of a place like Leeds suffer more from road casualties than the richer outer suburbs. And very often it's the rich people driving through those neighborhoods that are inflicting the harm. And that's true all across the globe. It's the rich people that can buy cars. They can buy the big fast cars. And the people they tend to be killing are the young, uh, particularly uh, pedestrians, particularly cyclists, particularly those who can't actually afford a car. Um, and so we have a built-in inequity. And why don't we do it? Well, one could argue maybe because of society, we don't care enough about it. We just accept that a few plane loads of people are killed daily. Uh, whereas when we have something like the 737 MAX disasters, two plane crashes, some company has to spend billions to fix it. So why aren't we willing to spend those same billions on road safety? We know the value of a human life. In the UK, it's about a million, a little over one million pounds. Uh, based on a willingness to pay study that was done uh, quite a long time ago now and deliberately for political reasons picked uh, a, a value at the low end of the range because otherwise of course if they picked a higher value the cost benefit studies would have come out more favorable to road safety and the government would have had to spend more so everything is sort of tilted against it and I guess yeah why do we accept uh, this trauma on a daily basis I guess one could say, well, somebody might argue, well, we don't know the solutions. Well, the most evident, um, evidence that we do know the solutions is that uh, Great Britain outperforms the US four to one in road safety. The US per head of population is killing four times as many people, yet the US is wealthier than Great Britain. So that would indicate the political system perhaps is broken in handling this problem. It all boils down, I think, to politics. Then one can say, ask, do we know solutions? Yes, we do know the solutions. I mean, we've just introduced uh, in Europe, we've legislated in Europe, a whole host of road safety measures, of crash prevention measures on new vehicles that some people see as actually being the most powerful single intervention in road safety that's ever been made, more powerful than requiring seatbelts. Is the US emulating that same set of measures? Well, there's every indication that it isn't. Uh, so the US seems willing to tolerate uh, a much worse performance than the rest of the world. I, I doubt most people in the US even know that that's the case. Um, and the government really has a kind of hands-off attitude. I was at a remarkable uh, session at TRB, the biggest annual uh, transport conference uh, held every year in Washington DC. This year it's being held remotely, but normally thousands of people descend on Washington DC uh, and stay in hotels in the center and whatever, and meet each other. And NHTSA held a special uh, session in which they were identifying what the problems were uh, in the US traffic statistics. And remarkably, they said, well, the biggest problem seems to be the weather. They were saying that uh, the current increase in road traffic deaths or the flatlining of US road traffic deaths was due to the fact of warmer winters, which led to more traffic in places like Florida and maybe even in snow states and whatever. 
And people in the audience were just questioning and said, well, you know, one well-known professor who's actually worked at NHTSA stood up and said, well, what about speed? Why aren't you considering the most obvious management system for road safety? The biggest safety, the biggest killer is high speed. And what are you doing about it? And there was really no answer from the assembled officials uh, to this. So that indicates that even at the top of the government, um, there isn't really the knowledge. On top of that, you might notice that uh, the administrator under the Trump administration, the administrator position has been vacant for the last two or three years. There's no, actually, no actual top leadership in place for the road safety, uh, for the federal government on road safety activity and uh, on persuading the states, persuading the vehicle manufacturers, persuading the people that build the highways to improve it. So I guess my simple answer would be, A, we have the knowledge, uh, B, um, we can do what we need to do for very reasonable cost uh, compared with, uh, with actual trauma, I mean, the, in the system that I worked on, intelligent speed assistance, which is the, basically the system that limits the speed of the vehicle to the speed limit, still allowing the driver to override if they really want to. Uh, when we did the benefit to cost calculation for that, the benefits in terms of lives saved outweighed the cost seven to one. Now it would probably be 20 to one because the equipment is so much cheaper than it was then. And yet we don't go ahead with these technologies. Uh, at least, well, Europe is finally moving ahead, but the rest of the world isn't. We allow cheap and nasty vehicles to be sold that kill the occupants and kill pedestrians, um, and we don't really confront the problem. It, to me, it's a question of A, social values, and B, political will. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Oliver. That was very... Uh... <clears throat> Very powerful as well. Um, so we'll we'll come back we'll come back to some of the uh, some of the issues you raised uh, in a little while. But I'll uh, bef before that I'll introduce the third speaker today, uh, Ian Stevens, MBE, who's uh, from a slightly different background to uh, the other panelists in the roundtable. In that until earlier this year, um, Ian was the suicide prevention program manager at Network Rail, which for those of you who are not from the UK is the authority which manages the rail network within the, within the UK. Um, and Ian's work was on developing strategies um, and approaches to reduce suicides around the rail network. Um, and uh, he's going he's gonna to speak about his, um, his work here to the, to the round table. Thank you. Andrew, thank you very much. And again, thank you for inviting me today. So yes, um, a bit of a focus change um, because my life has been dedicated to rail. I've been a railwayman for 34 years. So I'll move from road to rail. Um, and I've had a very specific role in the last eight years, which is managing suicide prevention on behalf of the rail industry in Great Britain. Um, 34 years ago, when I started, if somebody had said to me, well, is it worth saving a life? I would have said no, um, because it hellishly interferes with the rail network. And I'm speaking here specifically about suicide. <clears throat> and when I first started my role, I was told, don't bother trying to stop somebody taking their life because they'll take you with them and there's no stopping them. But more recently, I realized that to be true. Um, and as I go through the next few minutes, I'll explain some of the reasons I think it is worth saving those lives. Um, but it is a, is a cultural change um, in the way that we look at this issue um, and noting the question that was posed to the round table um, and the prelude to it about fewer people are now losing their lives. More people are losing their lives through suicide on the rail network and it's a problem that exists around the world and I've been fortunate enough to lecture and conference around the world again at the TRB which uh, Oliver's just mentioned about this very issue all railways suffer from the same issue which is suicides increasing on rail networks and that is because railways are a very vulnerable area for people to be able to take their lives they're unprotected even in Great Britain where there are uh, fences established around most of the rail network Railways are very vulnerable, and if people have the um, view of taking their life on a rail network, it becomes a very difficult issue to try and address and to stop. However, having dedicated eight years um, of my life to that, 
um, and working with some very dedicated people in this country, we do know that we can prevent suicides. And the reason we do that is that we believe we have a part to play in society well and beyond, well and beyond the social conscience that an industry may have or a manufacturer may have. We believe we are part of society and part of a wider community as a rail industry in this country, that we have to play our part along with many other agencies that seek to prevent people taking their lives. When I first started my role, um, I was told, well, you need to stop suicides because it costs the rail industry money. That's money that we can never reinvest in the rail industry. Um, and suicides cost the industry about 65 million pounds a year. And then, of course, there's delays um, that those suicides uh, impact upon travellers as well. Um, and those delays are around 800,000 minutes per annum. So if you're trying to get to a meeting, you may not be these days in the COVID times that we live in. Um, but if you're trying to get somewhere in a hurry, uh, go to an interview or get to a wedding, um, then you may be severely delayed. And we're having a suicide on the rail network in this country roughly every one and a half days. And there's a good chance people will be involved in that. And of course, as a traveller, a passenger, that will begin to infuriate. Um, and therefore, the reputation that that has upon in this country, Network Rail, and the transport operator, um, and the rail carriers, is quite substantial. Um, so that's when I came into the role. Basically, you've got to stop these things happening. We've got to stop hemorrhaging money. And we've got to start hemorrhaging um, minutes of delay. If I was to look back and think about the legacy that I can leave, it is that we've changed that perspective now. We very much see this in a different light. And it's the light of in initially our people, the people that work within the rail industry, uh, that it's important to stop deaths through suicide on rail networks. Um, it's the drivers that see it firsthand. So 99% of all suicides that are on a rail network around the world will be witnessed firsthand by a driver of a train. Um, and certainly here, we don't want our drivers to come to work and inadvertently kill people. And therefore, it's fundamentally important to us as an industry to prevent that from happening. It's not just drivers, though. Those trains, um, vehicles that then go into depots for maintenance or arrive at stations, our staff will see body parts on them, body fluids. And again, we don't want that for our staff. Um, we don't want um, PTSD um, to in become inset into our staff as a result of that. Um, and then, of course, we've got the issue about individuals, the individuals that go on to take their lives. Um, and I speak from experience here before I took this job, and it's not the reason I took the job. My daughter um, attempted to take her life. Uh, she sat in a road vehicle, interestingly. Uh, engine was on, staring at a brick wall and was determined to drive uh, into that brick wall at speed. Uh, the thing that stopped her was somebody that tapped on the window and asked her if she was OK. And at that point, she realized she wanted to stop doing what she was doing and seek help. Um, which, as a parent, is a very difficult thing to come to terms with, but a better thing to come to terms with than my daughter taking her life. So we know that lives can be saved. The interesting thing about my daughter is she's gone on to live a very rich and full life, which she wouldn't have led otherwise. And to me, that's fundamentally important for us as a society that we can offer hope to people that they can see, and I say it's not in all circumstances in all cases, but that they can see that there is hope and there is an offer of hope and that industries like the rail industry can provide that and point people, signpost people to that sort of support. Now that's a tightrope that we have to walk, of course, because one of the big issues about suicide is that if you start to talk about the method of suicide, people will be attracted to it. So that's been a fundamental issue for us because if we can't talk about suicide, then we can't start to put the message out about the work that we do and how you start preventing suicides on rail. So we've bucked that um, research and we do talk about suicide because we feel that's a way to get to people and address those individuals that may be suicidal and get them to seek support. The other approach that we've taken is that we recognize that we are never as a rail industry going to prevent people taking their lives by ourselves. Effectively, if you come to the railway, we are an option of last resort. You're either going to take your life or you're not. And it's very unlikely that you're not by the time that you reach the railhead. So an awful lot of our work now is within society um, and within those communities uh, that we are part of. 
and we act as a barometer if you like for those communities so that as suicides increase on the rail network we can start to alert local authorities and other agencies about suicides that are taking place in their areas and therefore they can address them within and at a community level hopefully before those individuals reach the rail network so my experience suggests that we can prevent suicides although they continue to rise both nationally in the UK and internationally but we can prevent them and we are part of a much wider group of organizations that seek to preserve life to allow those individuals to go on and live a richer and fuller life and to preserve those that work within the rail industry and support them so they're not coming to work and worrying about taking a life as part of the work that they do. Um, you asked me to speak five, seven minutes, that's seven minutes, so I'll stop there. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, back to you, Andrew. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ian. Uh, thank you, especially for the very kind of personal uh, focus of your uh, your contribution there. Um, so very three very uh, interesting speakers um, on three different uh, uh, topic, uh, sub subjects around, around the question. Um, and, uh, before before I ask uh, the, the panel uh, one of the questions that I've got, I just wondered whether any of the panelists would like to ask each other um, any questions about what was what's been been raised so far. If you have any, if you've got any, yeah, okay, Eve. What would you, yeah, please, I have a ahead. lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, coming to the panel to learn a lot, you know, which is great. Uh, to start with, Oliver, I'm really interested about the reflections about who know we know in fact the cost, right? Uh, we are aware also who, who are in fact the, the, the main victims when we talk about mobility and safety and it's really clearly distributed in our world. I'm interested, why are we in 2020, you know, in that situation? Is it, uh, as you mentioned, a lack of political will? Okay, that was your questions, but I'm also interested not just at the political dimensions. Do you have a feeling also that when it comes to car, and maybe my question is specifically related to car, uh, do you feel that uh, there is still a lack of awareness. Is it this very complex relationship that we do have as indiv individuals with the cars? I, I really would like to understand mm. more why it is so, we are so somewhat surprised still by, by what you said. Um, no, I don't, well, I don't think it is a lack of awareness. I think there's a lot of campaigning uh, on the issues. I mean, we can think uh, to drink driving, uh, we, et cetera, and all the campaigns on that, and et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we know the problems. Uh, we know the teen, you know, the teenage or young driver problem, novice driver problem. We know the solutions to that in terms of graduated driving licenses. So there, there's two. I think there's two answers here. So one is is the value on mobility versus safety. People often think that they are in conflict, that the safety community wants to prevent mobility. Um, and I guess there's some perception problems here. People think that, for example, by speeding or believe that by speeding, they save a lot of journey time. Well, actually, they don't. When we, many, many years ago, we did a, a kind of a simulation model of about the quarter of leads, and we looked at the difference between the then, the, the sort of the baseline traffic and what the average journey time would be, or increase in journey time would be, if everybody obeyed the speed limit. It was, the answer was three minutes. It made three minutes difference to a journey time, average journey time, which was variable day to day, uh, if you just kept to the speed limit. So it really doesn't matter very much. You spend a lot of time in driving, stuck in traffic. People actually think that by you know going five miles an hour or 10 kilometers an hour over the speed limit, they save a lot of time. Uh, we know that from actual uh, psychological studies that they overrate that saving. Uh, they, they think it's larger than it really is. It's, but there's another dimension as well. And that's who has political power and who has political influence. So you can, you know, I visited India and in India, what happens is that the city administrations, they build roads uh, for, for fast people, uh, you know, they people to drive fast. So they're more willing to spend money on a flyover than actually to spend money on uh, facilities. In New Delhi, it was one of the things that was really extraordinary is when you jump 
try to walk along a main arterial, yet it's actually physically impossible sometimes. They've put these beautification shrubs there, prickly shrubs, obstructing you from walking along the sidewalk, along the pavement. So where do the pedestrians have to go? They actually have to walk in the roadway to avoid, uh, you know, going through, literally going through these pr prickly shrubs. We tried it. It was almost impossible to walk along some of the main roads. So, you, you know, this is a totally ridiculous situation. You make it pretty for the car drivers, but you make it life impossible for pedestrians. And then you ask, People, well, what, this is a long answer, I'm sorry, but you ask people, why is this happening? And they say, well, it's the car drivers who have the politicians. They're the, you know, they know the politicians, et cetera, et cetera. They are the rich people, they have the political influence and they can push for measures to help them. Whereas the poor people have very little political influence and don't uh, get what they need in terms of road safety, infrastructure and safety. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Oliver. I think, uh, Eve, if you want to come back on that, and, and maybe I think you've got a second question as well. Yeah, thank you. First of all, the, Oliver, thank you very much. No, the other questions I, I was in my world, the, the world of, you know, war and, and natural disaster violence, among the most affected, you have women, but you also have young adults, very much so. And uh, Oliver, I know also that the numbers of death, right? If you look at, at road accidents, it's very clearly young people. And I was wondering, Jan, also in terms of, of suicide, uh, uh, how does that is, that, is that distributed across gender or also in terms of age? Would you say a word about, about that? Um, so certainly uh, in England and predominantly around the world, it is white males between the ages of 30 and 55 that take their lives. And that's where most suicide prevention activities are aimed, because that is the rump uh, of those that you are, are trying to prevent from taking their lives. Interestingly, though, around the world at the moment, there does seem to be an increase in young people taking their lives, although you can't attribute that to COVID. There's no correlation between COVID and social isolation and the issues that COVID brings um, and that age group uh, and also an increase in women. And we also know that people who self-harm are more susceptible to go on to take their lives than those that don't. And those that are affected, i.e. who may have somebody in their household who has taken their lives, are indeed also more affected and may take their lives in due course. But predominantly, uh, most um, suicide prevention activities are aimed at white males in that age group, 30 to 55. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and uh, just, to, just to say to the, the audience, if you have a question for Ian, uh, Eve or Oliver, please uh, put it in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll try and get to it. So really, I was just going to follow, before I ask my question, just going to follow up on what Eve said. And I wonder if the reluctance to um, intervene in terms of road safety, specifically around motorised traffic, is related to this idea of the personal freedom that the car gives you. It, is that is that um, an aspect across all levels of society which makes it more difficult to um, to regulate road traffic relative to other modes like rail or air, for example? Would you like to say anything, Oliver, on that? <laughs> yeah, um, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's interesting that the car is always sold on the, you know, the, one can look at advertisements, uh, commercials, whatever, for cars, and they're always advertising driving on an empty road through the desert or through some beautiful scenery, uh, often with a beautiful woman, you know, if they're targeted at males with a beautiful woman in the passenger seat and, and whatever. So, that yeah, they're... they're Cars are sold as being fr bringing freedom, uh, you know, being sexy in various kinds of ways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Instead of, of course, as being sold as being destructive and threatening, whatever. Nobody would sell something that way. So, yeah, I mean, there's an interesting question behind that as well, which is why do we tolerate uh, much higher risk in our day-to-day -day lives than we would tolerate from an operator like Network Rail, uh, an, um, an airline, uh, a train operator, a marine operator, et cetera, et cetera. We do, when we hand over our lives, when we hand over the responsibility for travel 
to someone else, we expect a very high level of safety. And we generally get it, at least in the Western world. We don't get, I think in the developing world, uh, you know, you can re read about horrific bus accidents and whatever. So generally they don't get it. But in the Western world, we do get it. And yet, you know, we're willing to say, well, um, we only want one tenth of the safety when we personally drive. And we're willing, of course, to inflict harm on others. So there is that. And there's a kind of expectation among drivers that it's okay to drive anywhere and any restriction on that driving is a kind of restriction of their right, their freedom, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, why don't we focus more on responsibility as opposed to freedom? You know, why should people have the freedom to drive uh, past some resident's home, um, inflicting both the risk of a crash and of course, environmental harm in terms of emissions, et cetera, pollution, and, and so on. Again, I, I'm very unequally shared. You know, rich people generally have better air quality than, than poor people uh, all over the world. So yeah, I mean, I think we do need to focus more on equity. Uh, you know, if we want a, a future world uh, in which everybody can share and act responsibility, equity is absolutely central. Okay, thank you. Eve, do you have anything uh, to add to that? This idea of the conflict between the personal freedom and the, the regulation of the, the state provides. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I see that, but, but maybe not just on road safety. I see that in a, in a, in a lot of different aspects uh, when it comes to violence. Uh, and it, Gun it, crime, it's yes. It's interesting. I, I, I'm careful now. I'm going into slippery slope. <laughs> when, when it comes to gun, for example, all my life I've seen people that are, in fact, including in a, in a you know, so-called a, a country in peace who have a relationship with their gun, which is a relationship which is very strongly related to their identity, but also to their freedom. Uh, and what we've experienced, and it's very similar, by the way, to, to cars, uh, it, the only way to, to, to manage that is to have a very strong legal framework. Otherwise, there is no options. I mean, if you just let them, them free, you know exactly what will happen. And I see that. I mean, across the board, across society, across culture. And again, interestingly enough, and maybe Oliver will say a word about that's then very gendered, right? This is very male, right? That is very male. So not so much then the question of poor and rich, but it's very male. So the relationship to gun, the relationship of how much the gun represents freedom and identity. And I've seen that very similar in a lot of countries, the relationship with cars. I, I, I know it's a bit complicated to make a direct relationship, but there is something here that is interesting. And here, if there is no clear regulation and enforcement of the regulation, you see exactly what, what happens. By the way, including in this country where I'm right now sitting, with, which is the US, interesting to observe and to compare with for example, other country like Canada, just the other side, and the difference in terms of framework when it comes to some of these, these questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have anything you want to add on that, Ian, at all? Or are you okay? Generally, I think you made the point earlier that uh, where you have transport systems that are regulated, there's effectively somebody to point a finger at. Whereas if you're an individual driving your own car, you're in your own domain managing that domain in the way that you best see fit um, and ultimately you only have yourself to blame. Um, the only other thing I would raise and uh, it's an interesting point Oliver makes is the number of accidents uh, on road networks uh, and a high proportion of events on road networks are obviously suicides as well and I don't know how Oliver distinguishes those things from accident statistics because I know in this country that the Hi Highways England have difficulty in doing that. So whether all road accidents are an accident or whether it's somebody who has gone on to take their lives and indeed more people in this country take their lives on the road network than they do on the rail network. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, that's correct. And there have been studies of suicide on the roads. Um, I don't think it's, it's the uh, most prevalent problem, but it is uh, a very significant problem. And of course, those people kill themselves in tend to kill themselves in single vehicle crashes. So when you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, pedestrians killed, cyclists killed, motorcyclists killed, et cetera, et cetera, those tend not to be suicides. So by the, um, in response to Eve's earlier point, yes, males are overrepresented all the way through the uh, road 
statistics, particularly uh, when you look at, if you like, contributory factors at the fault crashes, so young males in particular. But it's not always true that every problem is, is a male problem. So one of the interesting things we've looked at uh, um, mobile phone distraction in real world driving. And one of the interesting things there, at least in the UK, is women are more willing to do it than men. So uh, just having a mobile phone conversation, uh, a hands-free mobile conversation while driving is, is actually more common for women than it is for men. Um, maybe they just like socializing more or whatever. But I think it, it's not always the case that every single uh, road safety problem has a male versus female sort of predominance. OK, thank you. So um, I, we've got a couple of questions uh, in the chat, which I'll come to in a minute. But I just um, just wanted to ask a, um, a COVID related question, if I if I might. So um, a lot of the both the strategies that Oliver and Ian have described to to improve safety and to reduce accidents are around mitigation, around kind of reducing the, the harm. But I think potentially uh, what, co so they're around mitigation rather than necessarily behavior change. But what, what COVID has seen to have suggested to us that is that there is potential for behavior change both in terms of the amount of travel that we need to do and perhaps in terms of the way we, we travel in future and I wonder whether COVID uh, ironically can kind of like push safety forward by by actually changing the way we behave uh, so that we have less less chance of, of accidents occurring in, uh, in the future. If I, if I could jump in on that um, we are very much about social change, so it's not about um, preventing by engineering means. We continue to look for ways in the rail industry of influencing people's behaviour. We have a number of uh, high-profile advertising campaigns that go into cinemas and on television, um, which go under the badge of Small Talk Saves Lives. So it's, that's about influencing behaviour. We do a lot of anthropological research as well, where we see numbers increasing of suicides on the rail network. We use anthropologists to go and study society in those areas to see what the drivers may be. We actually see that whole social influencing and individual influencing as one of the key measures of managing this issue. Um, interestingly, with COVID, uh, in terms of suicide on the rail network, we believe it has a positive influence. Um, fewer people traveling and therefore people who may have thought about taking their lives being more conspicuous on the rail network. There are still the same number of rail workers able to identify those individuals who may be showing signs of distress. And also because there's been an increase in um, public messaging about welfare, looking after your health, about mental health and all the support networks that exist, um, certainly within this country. We believe that's having a positive impact in terms of those who may be at risk or have considered taking their lives in the past are actually receiving more information and more support than they ever would have done. And therefore, that's influencing their behaviour in a more positive way than before. OK, thank you. Um, if I could respond, I'll try and be brief. Um, behaviour change campaigning on its own uh, in road safety has been extraordinarily ineffective you can tell people to do something, uh, don't drink and drive, wear your seatbelts, don't get tired and whatever. On their own, they tend not to have much impact. You need to back them up with other measures. And what we've known um, for now for 50, 60, 70 years is that indirect measures, better engineering, improved safety on the roads, better infrastructure, vehicle safety that prevents occupants and prevents crashes uh, will save far more lives than campaigns with. Sometimes they go hand in hand. So if you have a campaign uh, instrument backed by enforcement, for example, speed cameras to stop people from speeding and then get points on their license so they lose their licenses when they're caught speeding multiple times, those will be effective. So carrot and stick together can work, but the carrot on its own, the campaign on its own tends not to work. In, if I can just respond, it's a very interesting point Oliver makes because we don't have a stick. We can't beat passengers with anything. But what we have found with the campaigns that we, we run is that 
prior to lockdown, when the um, traveller numbers were higher, there was a great sense of community. And certainly passengers were willing to support the rail network, be it because it was an altruistic thing and we gave them permission to do it, or because they realised that if they could prevent somebody taking their life, they weren't going to be delayed on the journey. Whatever the reason was, we gave them the tools and the permission to do that. And it's worked very effectively. And that's why the social issue for us is so key, because we have millions of travellers who can be the eyes and ears of the rail network and support those who may be in crisis. And we give them the mechanism by which to do that. Um, so we've had to take a different approach because there isn't that stick. But I absolutely appreciate the point that Oliver's making. Um, which is why the concept of suicide prevention is so challenging, because you're looking for those ways to get a wider group of people working with you. So now we tend not to be looking at those who are ultimately going to go on potentially to take their lives, but for those support networks that are around them to give them support that they're likely to need to think twice about taking their lives. Okay, thank you. Um, if I can just uh, look at, go to the chat and just ask a few of the questions uh, in the chat. So uh, a slightly more general uh, general question, perhaps perhaps for Eve, uh, based on communication strategies. So uh, from Camillo, is, Camillo is asking uh, around um, how, when inequity uh, and inequality is hidden behind aggregated data. How what kind of communi uh, communication strategies can you consider to help bring the issue of equity to the forefront of the discussion? So basically when, when it's hidden within the statistics. I'll be very br brief. I don't know if I really answered the questions, but I think it, it depends first of all. I think for me, one of the critical elements is to make sure that we have the research that bring the voice of the people uh, uh, in, up in front. I'm deeply convinced that uh, we can always do better when it comes to community-based, in fact, participatory approach. I think that is really one of the elements which is very central uh, and make sure that we don't hide behind, you know, aggregated data uh, 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 and that we have the, the data which are specific enough to be under, uh, able to understand that. Again, in my, in my side of, of the issues, we had a lot of issues to look, for example, at the gender-based violence. And we were able to start to understand the problems when we were able to really start to have specific data and, and, and really to have a very different strategy, not just on data, but on collecting the data, trying to bring, in fact, what are the in invisible nature, for example, of sexual violence. So I think it's a very explicit uh, strategy that brings not so much communication, but really goes and trying to give the voice of the people and make sure that we are, we are developing that when it comes to uh, then bringing that uh, at the forefront. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now maybe one for Oliver about uh, speed limiters. So could you say a little bit more about the uh, political and um, maybe like vested interests in, in not uh, pushing uh, speed limiters forward as a, as a technology for reducing speeds okay. and so well, on? So the system I've worked on um, is called intelligent speed assistance. So it, it's a limit, it's sort of a limiter. It's a limiter that encourages you to keep to the speed limit rather than forces you to keep to the speed limit. Why, do, why is that good enough? Well, because we can't actually at the moment create a technology that's 100% reliable. So if we, um, if we just have a very hard speed limiter, what will happen is that people will be limited to a lower speed. You know, they'll end up driving 30 kilometers an hour, 20 miles an hour on the motorway because the system has picked up an incorrect speed limit. So we've got to give some tolerance within it, but it hasn't been blocked. I mean, it is happening. Europe has legislated for it. Um, it was really interesting. The car industry actually fought tooth and nail to knock it out of the package of measures that came through in 2019 in the revision of what's called the general safety regulation, which is the minimum safety equipment that all new vehicles sold in Europe have to have. And that even now, after it's passed, they're sort of fighting a last ditch attempt at sort of watering that, watering it down to allow uh, a, just a pure auditory beep system instead of actually the, the, the uh, intervening technology that uh, I've advocated and which we know to be effective. So they're pushing one, a system that will annoy the drivers and therefore they'll switch it off because they will also be able to switch the system off for the current journey. So the vested interest of the, the car industry likes speed and doesn't seem to, it says that it's for safety, but it doesn't always put its money where its mouth is. In fact, it very often puts its money 
in the opposite uh, place and tries to fight against safety measures being adopted. In the US, uh, I guess it's different. Uh, you know, we don't have uh, the public consensus that would allow that kind of measure to be adopted. It'll be very interesting now to see whether, um, I guess there's been a almost a 30 year consensus since Ronald Reagan that uh, the, there should be very light regulation in the US on all kinds of measures. And it'll be very interesting to see now with the new government, whether that actually changes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Um, maybe I can just ask uh, Ian a question. So uh, your work with the suicide prevention is quite, uh, it's clearly tra challenging and you've made um, some big strides forward there. Do you think there's um, a realistic minimum level that you can get to in terms of suicides? You know, are, are you there? Do you think we're there already or? Um, I personally don't think we'll ever stop suicides on the railway. I think there is always that element of an individual self-determination. Um, and there will be people in crisis that no matter how much support you try and direct them to, they will always go on to take their lives. I, my personal view is we are pretty close to the number that we could ever expect to be at. When I first started this role, uh, we had no view on what the tactic would be prevent suicide or what the number would look like. After eight years, we are static in our number and the percentage of people out of the total population that go on to take their lives on the railway is fairly static as well, which rather suggests that the work we do, given the financing that we have and the will to do it, is regulating the number. Now, a lot of the work that we're looking at now as we've talked about already, is about that social shift and that social change and how can the rail industry influence that. So we do believe there is more that can be done. Um, it's just how do we reach those that can assist us in that and how much will is there elsewhere within the country that seeks to prevent suicide as well. So there's lots of agencies and of course it's a local authority responsibility in this country to look after those who may be in need. Um, and suicides on the rail network, whilst always considered to be network rail's issue and network rail's problem, are actually a failing elsewhere in the system because those individuals should never reach the railway in the first place to go on to take their lives or even take their lives by any other means. That's a failing somewhere else. And it's the willingness in other places to manage that that will ultimately influence people who take their lives on the rail network. And at the moment, the appetite isn't there, I don't believe, to do that further than the government already have. Um, that's more of a personal view, but until we can start to address some of those issues further up and address some of the social injustices, because we know suicide affects again, the poor more than it does the rich, until we can address some of those issues, social housing, issues around food banks and people that need to rely on those social issues to support themselves. Unless we can address those, we're not going to get the rail industry and those that support it and other agencies to be able to bring suicide numbers down uh, any further than they are and indeed we see an increase in this country as we do internationally in suicide numbers and I would suggest a lot of that is due to some of the social economic issues that exist around the world um, again which Oliver and Eve have said favour the rich rather than the poor. Okay thank you thank you I'll uh, I'll hand over to Mojtaba now to uh, um, finish up. Did sorry. Did you have something you wanted to add to that, Eve? At all? Sorry, I, no. It was okay. Okay, I'll, I'll hand over to Mojtaba to finish off now because, it, as always in these roundtables, the hour goes very quickly once we get started. <laughs> uh, thank you, Andrew, and apologies to, uh, to uh, a few people who didn't get to their question. And I'm going to be selfish and ask one question from Oliver. Uh, he's a uh, he studied history, so it's sort of uh, appropriate to ask this question. Uh, with the current situation and attitude towards facts and the, uh, what is happening around us, you know, do you really <laughs> see a bright uh, future for, for example, what's happening with Tesla or technologies that the hype is overtaking the reality and the facts? Do you see any possibility for this changing and becoming really a robust, logical, factful decisions and change? Okay. Um, 
I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the problems here that uh, the people in power actually often don't even know the facts. Uh, they don't know the cost of the measures. They don't realize that the uh, measures are cost effective and they think that the public are opposed to the measures. So we've, we've had that example very recently related to COVID and the um, attempt uh, to re impose some traffic restrictions in various cities in the UK um, to uh, promote active travel, to make active travel, walking and cycling more safe. And usually, or quite, you know, there's always a, a huge outcry and what it turns out is that this outcry is from a very small number of people. So there's a few, the media stokes up this stuff and there's certain newspapers that stoke it up because they, you know, um, they pander to this. I think you've had those, you've had the same with COVID and uh, um, campaigns on that and masks in the US. People actually do, you know, believe that masks save lives, but some people stoke it up. So what happens is that, you know, Communities get stirred up, but it turns out that 65, 70% of residents support these traffic restrictions, which are actually quite minimal anyway, you know, tend to say, you can't drive directly on this road, you've got to do a slight diversion so that uh, the people on, the, uh, on that street can have a pleasanter, safer life. And so, yeah, um, often the campaigns, the loudmouths um, are, tend to be uh, louder than the uh, general members of the public. And actually, if people, if politicians listen to what the public wants, they probably impose more safety. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, thanks to all our speakers. Um, I also, if Eve or Ian would like to say final thought, I would uh, welcome and you feel free to, if you have any final thoughts about our questions, Ian. Um, Yes, just going back to the question uh, that was posed for the round table. Um, I think for me, it is a an issue where we should seek to preserve life. I think that's a fundamental thing that we should try and achieve as individuals and as organizations. Uh, that would be my final point. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone. Uh, so please remember to, uh, this is a monthly round table. Our next round table is on uh, Thursday uh, 17th, I think, of uh, December on uh, mobility and disability, how to create an inclusive mobility system. And uh, thank you again. I put the link in the chat box uh, for you to uh, register in advance. And uh, thanks again. It was a, it was a great uh, roundtable and I hope we can continue the conversation. Yes, thank you very much to Eve, Oliver and Ian. Thank you very much for your time and for your contributions. Thank you.